the great Tabi'i Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Abdullah ibn Mubarak radiallahu an. In one of his poems, he says, "Wahal afsad dina illa muluku, wa ahbaru su'in wa rahbanuha, ba'u nufusa wa lam yarbahu, wa lam falam tagnu fil bayi athmanuha." Is there anyone who corrupts the social order other than kings, religious scholars, and the pious among them? They sold their souls without profit, and there is no gain to their trade. Al Muluk. These three classifications of people, as many of the Mufassirin say, they say that, or scholars, they say that there are three categories of people who are actually the main, the main cause for the corruption of society. One, we say the muluk or the kings, or we say the politicians. We can even extend that to say the, the elites, the wealthy class, because kings don't rule by themselves. Kings, they work with the wealthy. Secondly, Habar Rasul. Habar is a scholar of law. But in another sense, we can think of this as the sciences, those who are involved with exponential study, quantitative study. And then the Ruhban. A Rahib is a word for a monk or a priest. In other words, they're among the religious class people who are involved in religious devotion and they're less inclined towards scientific pursuits and endeavors. So he said when, three, when these three categories of people, they become corrupt and society falls apart. Society falls apart. So kings, the scientists, or the politicians, the scientists, and the religious uh, members or the religious scholars or those who are involved with religious devotion, those identified with being the pious among us, when they are corrupted, then all falls apart. There's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that says, The first thing to be removed from people will be trust. And the last of things that will remain among them will be prayer. Well, there are many people who pray who have no good in them. There are many people who pray but have no good in them. And there are multiple narrations of this hadith, one from Abu, Abu Umama, from Anas and Bumarik, from Zayd ibn Thabit, different, different narrations of the same hadith. That the very first thing that will be removed from the world is trust. And it should be no surprise that we live in a time where trust in politicians is at all time low. Trust in the scientific community and the medical community as an all time low. Trust in the media, the news people, newscasters are, is at an all time low. But even trust, unfortunately, in religious scholars is diminishing. It is unfortunately uh, becoming something uh, which parallels what we've seen over the years from other religious communities. Um, when I was growing up, the only time that you hear anything about a scandal, especially with relationship to some sort of um, sexual nature, it came, it was happening in the Christian community, you know, popular pri priests or whatever. Uh, but we started to see this more and more, unfortunately, among Muslims, among Muslims. And I think that there is a shared responsibility that uh, is between Muslim scholars, Muslim leaders, Muslim preachers, and even the community itself. And so today I wanted to talk about some of those things. I don't want to speak specifically about any particular case because I'm quite sure that many of you uh, have in mind something which recently happened. But I'll begin with this, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, The best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. 
He also said, Aftalu kalami about the Qur'an arba'. That they are the best of any words that anyone can speak or the best of speech after the Qur'an are four things. Wahiyya min al-Qur'an. And those things are from the Qur'an itself. They are from the Qur'an itself. La yudurruka bi ayyihinna badatta. And it doesn't really matter which of the four of those things you begin with. And then he goes and he, say, he says, Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. He so said, This is the best thing that you could say. After the Quran, and these things are from the Quran, Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, wallahu akbar, wa la ilaha, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. In another hadith, he said, Man shagarahu dhikri an mas'alati, a'taytuhu aftara ma u'tasa'ileen. That whoever is preoccupied by remembrance of me, and whoever is preoccupied from asking me for anything by remembrance and mention of me, then I should give that person the best that I give to those who ask. And then it goes on and says as well, And the superiority of the words of God over all other words is as the superiority of God over all creation. So the word the Quran itself is the most important, the most valuable of all the things that we have in this life. As so the ulama say, sharaf al ilmi bi sharafi mutaallaqihi that the 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 importance of the superiority or greatness of a science or knowledge is determined by the the nobility or the greatness and importance importance of the thing that it pertains to. And this is why when they talk about what we call the ulum shar'iyah uh, the sciences of the Sharia, they said the first and foremost, the most important of them is what we call Usul al-Din, which is theology or the belief in beliefs about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the qira'at, the different modes of recita recitation of the Quran, a tafsir, the exegesis of the Quran, wal fiqh, and Islamic law. So these are the foundational sort of religious sciences, the sciences of the Sharia. You know, so, because one is connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Creator. One is connected to the words of the Creator. And then also we learn the, the, the expectations of the Creator when we study the Quran and we study the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So when we find, of course, someone who is a teacher of the Quran falls short of their ethical expectations then it is a big deal, naturally. It's a big deal. In the same way that if we find individuals in our community who are identified with the, the class of the ulama, exploiting young sisters um, in different ways, then of course it's a big deal. Taking advantage of their innocence and their ignorance, it is a big deal. Even if you try to find a way to justify what you're doing, it is even worse when you find someone teaching young people or ignorant people, new Muslims, that, that sinful acts are a path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you do this sinful act, it's going to bring you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, it's, this is what can happen. And part of the reason that this is possible is because we have an unhealthy mindset or understanding of what our relationship is to both knowledge and to the holders of knowledge. And I'll come to that when I talk about communal responsibilities. We all commit sin. As the Prophet said, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. Every son of Adam is a sinner. And the best of those who sin are those who repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is related also by Isa or from Isa bin Maryam alayhi salam through the Muwatta ibn Malik says that among his statements was La tunduru fi dhunubi in nasi ka andakum arbab. Do not look at the sins of the people as if you are gods or you are lords. Wanduru fi dhunubikum ka andakum abid. You should look at your own sins as if you are slaves. Because people are of two different types. Either you are tried by sin or you are have recovered from sin. You are healed from sin. 
فَرْحَمُوا أَحْلِ الْبَلَاءِ So have compassion for the people who have been tried by sin. وَحْمَدُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْعَافِيَةِ And praise God, thank Allah for your well-being, for your own state of being recovered and healed from sin. So we, we of course, we don't stand judge over anyone in that particular regard. All of us, any of us can be tested by sin. As a matter of fact, the Sufis say that the wali, when the wali commits sin, that his most uh, challenging uh, struggle is with his shahawat, with his lust. Right, typically when we call, say, the, 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 the pious people when they commit sin is usually because of something related to their lust. So for instance, you find like narration about Imam Hassan al-Basri, radiallahu an, who um, was not known to make uh, indecent statements or unpleasant statements about anyone. Never made it a sort of vulgar statement uh, or even suggested anything uh, of any sexual nature about any particular woman. In one particular moment, he was sitting with his disciples and a beautiful woman, Muslim woman comes and she had some questions for him. And she sits down and she asks him these questions, seeking a fatwa. And, and his, his, his disciples relate, they say that when she rose up to leave, that he, his eyes followed her. And then as, as she walked into the distance, he didn't lower his gaze. And then once, she was away, he said, whoever has this one as a wife doesn't need any other. <laughs> in, in other words, that you can be tested, right? You put the average one of us in lockers in a room with a beautiful woman with no way to get out. It's just a matter of time. Anyways, we shouldn't think that we are sort of um, beyond, above being tested and in, 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 in placed into sin. And of course, I'm not trying to justify anything, but just to understand that all of us are vulnerable in this particular regard. And I think that one of the reasons we forget this is because there's such a focus on externalities. In other words, there are two different types of scholars, or rather three, put it, put it that way. But, well, one type of scholar we call an alim. So an alim is a person who has knowledge of the outward teachings of the religion. You get, you can study, you can sit down and touch, you can study with someone, study Tawheed, well, Aqidah, and they'll teach you about Allah and His attributes and oneness and His power and all those things like that. And you say, wow, mashallah. You know, teach you Arabic and teach you mantra, teach you logic, and she's like, mashallah, brilliant individual, right? And then there's also what we call the Arif. The Arif or the individual who uh, is a Gnostic or an individual who has experiential knowledge. Think about it like this. There are some people who teach engineering in the university and then there are others who are actual engineers. And the one who actually practices the art is different, has an insights that the other one who just simply teaches it, the theory itself, right, is something different about them. And of course, the advantages and disadvantages on both sides, so both the practitioner and the, the theorists, right? That both have blind sides. But then the third category of scholar, I say, is one that combines both of them. That you have exponential, then also experiential knowledge. And we have to understand this so that we are not dazzled or sort of deceived into believing that all that we see is all that we get, right? That there's, this is the, the public face is also the private face, right? Again, because all of us, and this thing is beautiful about taqwa, that the Prophet said, at taqwa hahuna, that taqwa is here in the heart. Do not ascribe purity to yourselves because Allah knows best those who have taqwa. Uh, that the most noble of you in the sight of God are those who have the most taqwa. Now, of course, there's an outward display of things which you can say, okay, this person is pious. He has taqwa. But that's an inward state as well. And the inward state, of course, is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why we have stories like the one in the seerah of the Prophet when there was a battle and one of the men in the, in the battle in the Prophet's army, he fought, fought valiantly, killed 
killed, people were like, oh, really impressed. He was very skilled with his sword and killing this many, this man, it kills another. And then when the battle was over, one, someone said of him, oh, what a, a great man and pious man, and this individual has done so much to serve uh, the religion and serve the deen and to, and, and he's, he's done this in, in, the, in the way of Allah. The prophet heard that and said, he's going to hell. About this particular man, this man, he just fought jihad and he killed what in the minds of the Sahaba for the sake of Allah, right, to protect the, the believers. And then one of them said, you know what, I, I, what, this is amazing. How could the prophet say this about someone? He said jihad is the greatest of all things that anyone can do and this person did it and how can he not be from the people of Jannah? So he tried to follow this man around. You know, try to see what was he doing? What was he doing that made the prophet say this? Until eventually there was another battle. And during that battle, he received a, a serious injury, very painful injury. And he was so overcome with pain, he couldn't stand the pain anymore. And one particular night, he took his sword, he put it here in the middle of his chest, and he committed suicide, killed himself. And the prophet said, he's from the people of the fire. He's from the people of the fire. So we never know. So we have to get back to, again, trying not to be deceived by externalities. Now, in terms of like our communal obligation, I'll say this, is that, okay, yes, that the ulama have a great burden. Our leaders have a great burden. But also, I want to talk, to, talk about certain conditions that I believe personally, seven things I believe are what create the conditions for this to happen. And if we don't make changes, then it will increase. Allahu A'lam, but that's what I, my, I believe. The first problem, the first mistake of our community has been, we've created a celebrity culture around Muslim preachers. And I say preachers because that's fundamentally what we have for the most part. We have Muslim preachers. There's a lot of preaching going on uh, among, or in the sort of the mainstream um, um, activities of our community that creates celebrity culture. There are too many preachers and not enough real talented or scholarly individuals in the preaching realm, in the public sphere. Secondly, there's a culture of misandry. You know, we always hear misogyny, we don't hear what's called misandry. You know, if you think of misogyny as hatred for women, misandry is a man hatred. There's a culture that's developed as well of misandry. That in other words, that there we've developed this idea that men are not supposed to be protecting women. That our religion teaches us that no, men have the responsibility to protect our women. So I don't need any man's help. But yes, you do. Yes, you do need protection of, 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 of men. If you want to get married, you, you have men in your family who need to be there to ensure that people are vetted. You need advice from the men in your family about the type of things that men could do. We have to give this up, shake it off, because that in itself has undermined many protections. And add on top of that, because of this, you do have also uh, certain organizations in the Muslim community that have, uh, have arisen with the express goal to find dirt on imams. Again, that's exactly, that's the only reason why they exist. I've had people come to me who actually work for some of these organizations and say that, yeah, they've been trying to find something on you. That there's, there's organizations in our community. And we have to be very careful because they come off as well-intentioned, but again, there's, there, there, there's a bias there that they're trying to expose, right? Things that may not even be there, may not even be that serious, even if they do find something. Thirdly, we have the problem of the technological tools of narcissism that have developed in our lifetimes. They call it Facebook, they call it YouTube, they call it all the other things that we see that exist now. Everyone can project themselves. Everyone wants to be famous. And that's natural in all of us, that you want to be famous. The Sufis say that the last thing that leaves the hearts of the 
murid is the love of status, the love of, of leadership. It's the last thing, it's the, very, it's the most difficult thing to get rid of. All human beings suffer from that. We like to be noticed and be magnified. And so we have these tools that, that are able to do it, not only to, to help us become famous, but also become a source of income. Income streams are created through this. There's so many people who become popular who shouldn't be popular, in my opinion, right? Even in our community, they're making a lot of money doing it. A lot of money doing it. Spreading corruption in the process. Fourthly, I would say that there's a lack of avenues to real wealth among imam scholars and teachers, at least most. Alhamdulillah, some of us are blessed and we find, alhamdulillah, good work. And we're very appreciative of that. But the vast majority of those who go overseas, when they come home, they, they really don't know what to do. You know, and if they, and so people are struggling because people, you know, they, they find a way to survive, but it's like, well, I want to lighten the burdens. So how can I lighten the burden? People become entertainers, religious entertainers. So as a market, I got to compete and I have to act this way, act that way, right? And, and we have to learn how to detect this, that, we, you know, is this, is this normal for someone to act like this, to speak like this? But again, it's like, okay, well, I'm in a profession which when we compare it to other professions, the salary is not going to be as significant as it would be for others because the demographic which is concerned or values this particular profession is very small compared to the others. Even Ibn Khaldun talked about this. You know, that, that the teachers, they're always going to, they're always going to have the sort of the, the, the least, the most, uh, you know, smallest type of salary because the people who are concerned with religion are very small compared to the larger population. So instead of, and so in other words, there's an attitude, an idea, in other words, it's as if like they don't know what else to do. Now, well, alhamdulillah, I mean, I, again, I'm not bragging, but like for me, I'll tell you that, that if I wasn't doing what I do, I'll go do something else. In other words, I mean, I've, I've worked many different jobs in my life. I was a barber, I was a security guard, I used to paint houses. I mean, we, even growing up, you know, we, we need money, go cut hedges and you knock on doors and, hey, want me to rake your grass, you want me to shovel your snow. But quite often, often what happens with, of course, the younger generations coming up now is that, hey, I went to school for this and this is the only thing I can do. Right, so I have to find a way to become rich doing what I do and so, unfortunately, they go to extremes in this particular regard. Number five, there's a lack of self-mastery. There's a, a level of greed and competition for community attention, as I mentioned before. In other words, the exteriors, we are concerned with what we see. Mashallah, that brother is a good speaker. Oh, mashallah, brother's charismatic. Mashallah. So we, we, to the community, we look at those things. And, and those things are important. We need people who can speak well, who are charismatic. But we also need to consider, too, um, if there are any red flags, right, that come to us when we consider this. Are we focusing on the wrong things, right? Are those people themselves, what type of scholars are we talking about? Is this an Adam or an Arif? Or is it Adam and Arif together? Because you need the practitioner as well. All of us should be practitioners. We should be people who are introspective. That we're trying to constantly change ourselves, do better, get mastery over our passions, not allowing our passions to, to rule us. But we shall master them, we rule them. Number six, there's a lack of study, or rather, lack of interest in serious study among the majority of Muslims. Now, of course, again, this itself is rel relatively normal, right? But again, but if they, I believe that if there was a larger interest in serious study, I don't mean like Sunday school study of Islam, then it will be easier for us to not be easily impressed by information that to the learned would say, well, it's very basic stuff, right? We're very basic things. Sometimes it's because we just like certain people's personalities more than others. I say, well, this individual, it's all the right things. 
says all right things. What does the community want to hear? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, sisters, they need more rights. Yes, ah, yeah, yep, yeah. those things. Yeah, I'm not saying that people are insincere when they say that. But I'm saying, but sometimes this is what happens. Like we, we put our feelers out, okay, what, what do people want to hear? What do they want to hear? Right? And, but it, again, with we ourselves understood that there's a different degree of knowledge, you know, an internal type of knowledge that others need to be focusing on. And we need to know if they are focusing on, focusing on those things, then perhaps that would prevent a lot of these abuses. And then lastly, like as mentioned before, we have a very unhealthy attitude towards preachers, an unhealthy attitude. Now, some of us think that if we find someone who we consider to be the one, that we have this obligation to endorse everything that they say, to embrace every opinion that they have, to agree with them in everything that they, but they, that they do, to be or show blind allegiance even. There are these extreme examples, but they exist in our community. But anyway, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he rid us of the scandals. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he does not punish us for what others have done nor punish us for our lack of engagement with the Quran and the Sunnah and making it part of our lives, making it part of our ethos. Insha'Allah. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد الخير الأولين والآخرين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Before closing, I wanted to just simply read part of a hadith from حذيفة ابن يمان رضي الله عنه the Sahabi, great Sahabi who knows a lot about trust, what trustworthiness is about. He was called the keeper of the Prophet's secret. In other words, he was given knowledge that no other companion was given. He was given knowledge of who all the hypocrites were. And the Prophet told him, tell no one. And after the Prophet's death, Umar al Khattab insisted that he tell him. He said, no, I told the Prophet, so I said, I would keep his secret. So Hudayfa, he said, Inna al-amanata nazara fi jadri qulub al-rijal thumma nazara al-Qur'an fu alimu min al-Qur'an wa alimu min al-Sunnah. Said, trust descended into the core of the hearts of men. And then the Quran came down or descended, and then they gained knowledge from the Quran and they gained knowledge from the Sunnah. Then he goes on to say that a person will go to sleep at night and a manna will be removed from their hearts. Next night, you go to sleep, more trust will be removed from their hearts. Then he said, For you to be her nasu, you say, Ya una, la ya kadu, ahadun, you addi, you addi al amana. He said, Then people will, will do or be involved in trade to the point that almost no one fulfills his trust. Hatta you call, Enna fi bani fulan and rajul and aminan. He said, It was so bad that people will one day say that there's a trustworthy man in so-and-so village. We should go find that man. حَتَّى يُقَالَ لِلْرَّجُلِ مَا أَزْلَدُهُ مَا أَضْرَفَهُ مَا أَقَلَهُ It will get so bad that people say of this individual, oh, how strong he is, oh, how nice he is, oh, how intelligent he is. وَمَا فِي قَلْبِهِ حَبَّدُ خَرْضَنٍ مِنْ إِيمَانٍ and that same individual will have not even a mustard seed amount of faith in his heart. But this is what people will say. Because again, they focus on exter exter externalities and abandonment of things that would help them to discern the true from the false. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grant us discernment.
I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it keep our hearts pure and the hearts of our children, of our loved ones, all of those around us, and make us a source of guidance and improvement for those around us in this society and around the world, inshallah.